So we are live now. Hello. Hi. Hi, everybody who is online. Welcome. We are going to wait for a couple more minutes until more people join. We're already quite a few. Um, but uh, since we had a lot of registrations, we want to give a chance to everybody who is not uh, awake yet in Latin America to <laughs> brush their teeth and come in front of the screen. So uh, in about three, four minutes, uh, we will start. Until then, please feel free to say hello. I see you already started. Uh, greetings from Rotterdam. So just tell us uh, hi, your name, where you come from, and let's get to know each other a bit uh, on the chat. Yeah, hi, everyone. I will just uh, start in a few minutes. Uh, we have already Stefana 165 attendees, right? So the moment we reach 200, uh, we will uh, kickstart this uh, webinar. Let's see. Stefana, one question. Can people see how many attendees are, the number? I'm not sure. Uh, maybe you can let us know in the chat. I think yes, in general. Now you can um, see the number on, on to the, to the you, left. Yeah, you're able to see on top uh, next to your chat options. I think everybody should okay. be able to see. Yeah. 183, so I think very soon yeah, we start. In a minute or so, yeah, I think you can start. They are saying that they can see the attendees. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay, I can see in the chat that a lot of people from the Philippines, from Indonesia, so Asia, Africa as well is there, Latin America. People from the ASHP, the Developing Social Housing Project, the Housing Specialization. It's very nice. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm. I think I'm going to start. Okay. Right. So, welcome everybody to this uh, first webinar of the housing uh, team of the IHS, as we like to call ourselves. The housing team of the IHS is made of myself, Alonso Ayala. Uh, uh, Marge van Eert, Baharas uh, Sakisiglu, and David Shelkshorn. Uh, David will talk uh, uh, after uh, myself. I'm, I'm in charge of doing the introduction because apart from welcoming you, because this is a very nice uh, moment uh, for us, because what we want to achieve with this uh, seminar, this web seminar, a series in housing, is to create this knowledge platform in which scholars and, and alumni of IHS and also the general public interested in housing can have the opportunity to share their professional experience in housing. Because the housing challenge, as we, as we, as we uh, usually uh, call it, or the housing affordability crisis, is way from being solved. And one thing that this uh, pandemic that we are experiencing, this very difficult moment that we are going through, all of us, one thing that has shown uh, the, this uh, pandemic is that inextricably link that exists between adequate housing and health. And as long as the housing conditions of people, and this is the great majority, especially in the global south, uh, the living conditions of people in terms of, of housing conditions are inadequate, as we, as, as we call it, the health problems will prevail. So this discussion is much more broader than what we would, uh, what we can do today. And we 
want to also talk about the things that are possible, the possibilities that are there to, to improve this, this housing uh, condition, this housing situation. And we have today two very special guests. These are uh, both of them, Lucia and Diana, are housing, uh, are IHS alumni. Actually, Diana is from the planning specialization and Lucia from the housing specialization. They are both in Latin America, Lucia in Mexico, and Diana in Colombia. And they will talk today about the importance of technical assistance for incremental housing with the underlying title, which is about rethinking habitable spaces as a solution to the COVID-19 crisis. What I would like to highlight before I give the word to, to David is that in Latin America, 30 to 60% of housing is self-produced by low-income low income families. And that number is quite important because it shows the housing challenge that we're talking about. Problem is, or that is in the literature at least and the experience, and Lucia and Diana will talk about this mm -hmm. later probably, is that there is little to non support to this incremental process, the way of producing houses, self-produced uh, produ uh, production of housing. But uh, without further ado, thank you very much again for being here. We have already the 210 uh, mark, that's uh, very nice. I hope you enjoy this uh, web seminar. And now I give the word uh, to David. But before I go there, sorry. Uh, since we are in this pandemic, we have these measures that we have to keep the social distance. But David and I are now sitting in IHS uh, together, keeping the 1.5 uh, meters. So what I will do is I will move out of the screen and then he'll come in to make sure that you see that we are, uh, yeah, that we comply with the rule. So thank you very much. And I'll see you later when the question and question and answer part comes. Hello, everybody. Nice to have so many attendees today. We didn't expect this high number, so we're very happy. Yeah, as Alonso said, we, we keep our social distance. I prefer the term physical distance because social distance sounds a bit more negative. Mm -hmm. um, you already introduced um, our two speakers uh, a bit. So we have two alumni talking today, two experts uh, in the field of housing. Uh, our first speaker is Lucia Valenzuela. She's an incremental housing expert from Mexico. Um, she pursued her uh, a master in IHS in the Master Urban Development and uh, Urban Management and Development, where she conducted joint research on government's provision for affordable housing in Thailand. With the support of the Department of the Housing Department and IHS, but also with the Asian Coalition for Housing Rights. Um, after her graduation, uh, Lucia collaborated with various institutions, also with the uh, Human Geography and Spatial Planning Department of the Utrecht University, with the Daida Foundation, uh, also with uh, IHS and Habitat for Humanity for International. Uh, yeah. Currently, she is the coordinator for the Institutional Liaison at Centro de Apoyo Mejoremos, which is one of the most renowned organizations in Mexico, specialized in providing social and technical assistance for incremental housing for low income families. So that's uh, Lucia. She's our first speaker today. Mm -hmm. Our second speaker uh, is uh, Diana Munoz. She also graduated in IHS in the Urban Management and Development Master. Uh, Diana is an expert in land management and planning and the development of social housing. Uh, she was director of a national land use plan program in the National Planning Department of Colombia, where she also led some uh, countrywide World Bank funded programs. Um, besides that, uh, Diana was the director of the city planning department of the city of Cali. And since 2019, uh, Diana leads the Colombia's country world country program of the international NGO Build Change. Uh, Build Change conducts capacity building programs and designs disaster resistant houses and schools in areas which are prone to natural hazards in emerging nations. So in her current position, she's responsible for coordinating active projects in Bogota and Medellin, 
And besides that, she uh, supports the organization's position as a trusted advisor. Um, yeah, we are really happy that both Jan and Lucia have time today to share their experience with all of us. And uh, yeah, if I, I, I would encourage all the attendees today to send a lot of questions during the presentation. So please use the chat function and, and write your comments, write your questions uh, during your presentations. Because in the second half, we will um, yeah, make a Q&A session. So we will discuss the discuss topics later on. So yeah, conscious of the time uh, and conscious that you want to hear more of the speakers today, I give now the floor to Lucia, our first speaker. OK. Uh, can you see my slides? Yeah, perfect. Yes, we can uh, see. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, David, and thank you, Alonso. And hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Lucia Valenzuela, as, as David introduced. And I'm the coordinator for institutional liaison at Centro de Apoyo Mejoremos. So before explain the relation that we have found between housing and COVID. I want to give you a little background so you understand what is the approach that we are taking from. Uh, so Mejoremos in Spanish means uh, let's improve. And we are an assistant self-help entity specialized in providing technical and social support for families who want to build their house incrementally. Uh, we put the family at the center and then we partner with financial uh, organizations of the public, social and private sector in order to give uh, affordable financial schemes to the people that we work with. Uh, we have been around for more than 12 years. We have interventions in seven states and we are really proud because we have made more than 7,500 individual projects in incremental housing. Uh, so when this old pandemic started, uh, the government was saying, get out in casa, stay at home. So this started a debate, like, do you have enough space to isolate in case uh, a member of your family's gate is, is get sick? And then what kind of home is it? Is it some, a place where you can be safe from the environment? Do you feel comfortable? Or what are the factors that you need to have that transition from housing to home? Uh, right now, the national government has changed the paradigm and it has recognized that a lot of the housing in, the, in Mexico has been done incrementally. Right now, 9.4 million homes are considering the housing shortage and it has been recognized that the first six decils of income are virtually excluded from the housing market. This means that they have made their homes by themselves 65% and 70% without financial support. As for the shortage that they have identified, the government states that 80% are because of uh, temporary materials in construction and 20% because of overcrowding. As the actions needed, they, they state that 78% need to be improvement and enlargements and 22% a complete replacement of the home. What does this mean in COVID? Well, uh, before Diana and I were discussing and we both realized that in our countries, COVID is going to be a, a long pandemic. Uh, here we have really dense cities in which the housing conditions are not that good. And most importantly, people still need to go out to work. We are both economies that need to, to work day by day and that they cannot stop. So we have to realize that and know how to work about it. In the specific case of Mexico, a preliminary study has showed that Overcrowding is going to be a most a more important variable than age in if someone has COVID to pass away. This means that if three or more people are sleeping in the same room and already have a one already has the disease, 3.4%, it's an increase of 3.4% that maybe they would pass away because of COVID. However, are there other factors that need to be considered? And we think, yes, it's not only about enlargement or getting more space because of getting more space. It's about also 
realizing the needs that each family has in terms of function of the family, habitability, ventilation, illumination, security, that are going to be important factors, not only in COVID, but also in subsequent pandemics or, or disease, or even in, in day-to-day -day health. This is a study that we made uh, with data from 2016 to 2018 of our interventions in Ecatepec. Uh, Ecatepec is the largest municipality in Mexico and also in Latin America. And this study was important because it shows how people are building in, den in really densified areas. We realized that 96% of the cases, we already have existing construction and that 73% need an structural uh, plan. So even if it's an enlargement, even if it's a, a new house, most, most of the new houses are 70% in rooftops. This means that they are going to grow the house instead of, we are not dealing with new housing in which we can plan. We have already existing conditions that we need to take into consideration. So then from our experience, we take three takeaways. First is that people prefer enlargement and, and improvements than over finishes. This means that they know that finishes, they can do it over time, but there are persistent needs that they need to solve as soon as possible. Most of the problems that we found are related to habitability and structural security, both of them really connected to technical assistance. It's not, in, it's not only what people know, but also how to do it in a secure manner and having the professional support to do so. Then improvement interventions cannot be standardized. Each family is different, each family has a different need and we need to address that. Thus, technical assistance is not a luxury, but a fundamental component to secure adequate housing and the right to choose. Often we have realized or we have connected a technical assistant and as the support of an architect with the formal market and incremental housing as precarious and, and doing without order. However, this, not, this doesn't have to be the case. Uh, every house needs to have a still uh, a safe component and every family needs to have the rights to choose the means and the way in, in which they are going to live. This is a case example of, of the usual or regular improvements that we make. In here, you can see that there are four family units living in the same plot, in the same house. However, uh, habitability conditions have, are not being met. Uh, when, when the architect arrived, there was not enough light. Uh, there was not enough ventilation. And one of the, per of the people was living in, in the living room. This was uh, suggested as overcrowding. So then how do you address this? The first thing that the architect needed to know was to sit with the family and decide what to do. It's in the, it's in the decision making of the family that the project is going to be developed. So then uh, after that conciliation and after the architect giving the professional advice of how to go about it, they did a refunctionality of the house in which, yes, there was an enlargement, but also there was a separation of spaces for the four family units to cohabit together in a um, habitable manner. So then it's not, it's not only that the architect is going to give an architectonic solution, it's also, it also has to understand what are the needs and how to solve them. Uh, here is another case that I, I really like because it really shows how incremental housing works. It's not only that incremental housing, you have to do it and design a space by step. You need to do it progressively and give the full project to the family because the, once they fell in love with the project, they're going to do it by, their, by themselves. So in here, it's a case in which they had two interventions, one in 2014 and one in 2019, in which it was Patricia, living with her mom, her brother, and two of her kids. So they said, they said, okay, I need more space. I need more space, but I need to do it in a way in, in which I have to consolidate first what I have in order to grow this, the house. So they said, okay, first we're gonna consolidate and then we're gonna grow. In 2019, they grow the house, but because they already had a plan to do so in a correct manner, they had already engaged with the project and they were not willing to commit to not do it in a in a less standardized way or in a to compromise quality. So in here, although the riches of the project was to do an enlargement, the family decided that they were going to put all the finishes because they were already 
realizing that that was the kind of home they can have. So then just to go really quick as a food for thought uh, is that COVID-19 is not only a health issue, it's also made visible social inequalities that need to be addressed, not only in housing, but in general, just that housing as an important component of how to secure health in this, in this time. 60% of the Mexican household have been built their homes with their own effort. And this reality needs to be addressed and supported. It's not enough that we realize how they're, they're building, but how can we make it in order for, to be safer? Uh, a house is more than just four walls and a roof. Professional support is needed. Uh, often, incremental housing has been addressed as precarious or or that not meet certain criteria. However, if you do it with the professional support, it can be habitable, safe, and dignified. And finally, technical assistance guarantees adequate housing and the right each family has to choose. Not because it's done incrementally, we have to compromise in quality. And right now, as housing becomes more an important issue, we have to consolidate the existing housing stock that we have. And that was my presentation, and thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Lucia, for this uh, very short and sharp uh, presentation, which is exactly what we wanted. So we have the opportunity also to have a, a broader discussion uh, later on. There are a couple of things that, of course, showed up in, in your in your presentation, and maybe we can keep it, we can keep uh, them in mind for for the for the Q and A. But what can I what I can say is that the question of habitability. It's a big one, especially when you talk about incremental housing right. because of housing standards. As long as the standards prevent people from making housing habitable because it's not finished, no, that's the that's the talk. That is obviously a problem, which I'm sure you experience in your in your uh, daily life when you debate this with the, with the government, etc. But let's see now. Uh, what is that that Diana have to share uh, with us about technical assistance in incremental processes in housing in Colombia? And therefore, I will give uh, immediately the, the word to Diana. So, Diana, please, you can start your presentation. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, could you please put my presentation? Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everybody, and thanks for joining to this webinar. And thanks to IHS, also at Erasmus University, to having me here today. Uh, I will focus my intervention in the importance of technology to provide technical assistance to the stakeholders involved in incremental housing improvement projects. I'm Diana Muñoz. I'm the country program manager of, for the office in Colombia at Build Change. Um, yeah, we, in, in Build Change, we work applying a bottom-up approach and we start to understanding the context where the houses are. Uh, we apply this to all the countries when we have worked and we always answer this question. Why are things this way? How we can solve the problems that the families have or that, that the houses presented? And this was not the exception to the Colombia case. Um, this is our experience in Colombia, mostly in Medellin and Bogota, and in where Build Change uh, arrived more than six years ago uh, to work on prevention programs for the risk of the collapse uh, of incremental houses due to natural disasters, uh, particularly in Colombia, earthquakes. At that time, we mainly stimulate awareness in population authorities and other stakeholders. Uh, just to contextualize quickly, I, I, know that, that I know that I don't have too much time, but since 1930, uh, the migratory processes in Colombia moved people from the rural areas to the urban areas. And this mainly was generated by the armed conflict. Uh, this phenomenon caused the expansion of the main cities in Colombia, and the local authorities do anything to stop it. Nowadays, informal areas are consolidating, as in this picture, 
where new homes are no longer located in the periphery. Now, the number of stories of existing homes are increasing, and this, of course, increment the risk exposure of these homes more and more. Uh, this is how the informal neighborhoods in Medellin seen, where the houses are quite consolidated due to the lack of available land in the city. Finding an informal one-story home is a real challenge in Medellin. And this is Bogota, where some studies show that the, between 1950 and 2000, uh, half of Bogota's occupied land corresponded to informal developments. Official data shows the increase in the housing stock in the city, but in existing homes, that is, incremental houses. Being this phenomenon, the new informality. The number of houses in transitory materials are reduced because there are more controls for new areas to be urbanized. Uh, and the old houses now are enough consolidating. The first thing we thought when we saw this, when you see these pictures and we, when we arrived to Bogota uh, and Medellin, is that it's impossible to establish patterns because everything is so confusing, tangled and informal that we set up to up the scale and better understand the context. So we have to zoom in and we started to classifying the houses by different typologies. And in this case, we found one story house and also we found it two story houses, three story houses, and even more and more. We analyzed everything of the houses, the materials, and for example, the most common modern construction system, as we can see in these two pictures, is masonry, either unreinforced, confined, or everything in between. And we can find examples with mixed techniques, materials, with occupied cantilevers, and many, many examples. And the only thing that we can assure uh, is that all, all of them are unfinished. And of course, also with endless technical problems in its construction. And what do you think is the common factor here? For sure, lack of technical assistance. So uh, how do we know this, uh, this thing? Let me introduce you to uh, Jorge Prada. Jorge Prada is a construction worker in Bogota who has built it, his own house and from whom he, we learned most of the things we apply later on in Solutions to Colombia because his case was our first experience, experience in a real case in Colombia. Jorge Prada cannot receive a subsidy a housing subsidy because he doesn't meet the requirements of documents established by Bogota and the national government. He is not a formal worker, so he doesn't belong to the employee funds. And of course, he will not uh, receive a loan from a bank. Therefore, self-construction is the only way for Don Jorge to build his own house. Uh, he only has the option to produce his house step by step, uh, with the materials and resources that he can invest up after comply his family immediate needs. This scheme is repeated for many families living in informal houses and it, and it is difficult for them to get out of this vicious circle of poverty. He has an acquired knowledge for the experience, but he hasn't had a formal training. He builds houses in his neighborhood and in the application of his construction techniques, he commits mistakes and produce sometimes vulnerable houses. He doesn't know and he doesn't have to because his experience tell him, tells him that he can build homes with certain characteristics and he hopes that anything will happen. But sadly, it does. More than 75% of the buildings built in Bogota are in unreinforced main story construction method, which is not safe and not comply the legislation. In this study carried out by the Institute of Risk Management and Climate Change in Bogota, they modeling a designed earthquake of magnitude 7.3. 
The value of the damages that Bogota would have amounts to $18 billion. These models include just economic losses. I'm not going to mention the loss of human lives. So in general, the risk exposure in a city like, like Bogota is extremely high. Um, like Jorge, uh, there are many construction workers in the informal sector in Bogota, and they are not the only ones who build houses. Families also do it with their own hands as they get materials in a consolidating process that takes many, many years. As the house grows, the exposure to risk also increases. For that reason, construction workers and homeowners should have access to technical assistance. When we arrived at Jorge Prada's house, offering our training and helping him to understand what the construction problems on his house could be, uh, he has doubts and went so far as to assure that we were burning the money with the retrofit process that we were uh, working on his house. But then later on, he understood and felt safer to expand his house, to increment his house according to his needs and being clear about the steps he should take to go on. At uh, Build Change, we based uh, we base our efforts on this theory of change uh, diagram, where it is shown that several elements are required to achieve a safer building. Money, people, and also technology. Um, in, the, in the development of technology, our efforts include the development of adequate technical tools and training of local professionals. In this context, we produced this manual in 2015 to address seismic evaluation and retrofit design for low-rise masonry houses to reduce its vulnerability. By today, this is the only and accepted common and accessible technology in Colombia to intervene existing houses of informal nature. Uh, in the development of technological tools, uh, we have explored and developed in some countries different methodologies with different purposes. It, this is an example in, in Nepal, where uh, we can see a house screening using artificial intelligence, AI. Innovative use of artificial intelligence code to identify vulnerable houses that would be good candidates for seismic retrofitting. And for the innovate linkage of AI, with 3D modeling then that can make uh, the AI operational within days of a disaster. Actually, in Colombia, we are now working in an AI project to quality assurance and quality control to apply on field in the construction process of the houses. And we also have been working in the production of design libraries with possible solutions. This is developed with the prescriptive approach based on the analysis of several houses, as I mentioned in the beginning of, 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 of the presentation, and proposing typical solutions to the common problems. Those are some examples with different types of houses. And yeah, we have been also developed uh, pre-engineered type designs, as this example also in Nepal with standardized structural design. And uh, I love this part of my, of my job. Uh, we have been working also in, in the automated retrofit uh, design tool, custom programmed scripts, import this field data and automate the creation of a 3D model and 2D drawings of the existing house in just a few minutes with all structural components included. We customized construction documents to produce the 3D beam model auto automatically and quantifies volumes and number counts of construction elements, produce bill of quantities, and these are automatically updated as modifications are made. A full set of engineer drawings ready for construction can be directly exported from the, from the 3D model at the click of a button. Information can also be referenced directly through the model and included in the drawing package for building permit applications. This is so important in Colombia because it's required to, to have this permit to intervene a house, to retrofit a house. 
Uh, we also have quality assurance and reporting dashboard. This is an example with a field survey uh, questionnaire for construction monitoring and resulting records and, uh, and the dashboard also. This is um, another example in Dominica where we developed that management information system, MIS, in which the government will report their housing programs using this platform. And this is another example of, of our technology tools. This is a mobile data collection to apply to the homeowner and to assess the house, uh, where the measurements are recorded in the mobile app. And these technological tools are, all these technological tools are developed to make a process of home improvement improvement much more efficient, put technology at the service of those who need it most. But this implies a huge technical effort um, to a deployment process in the field for which we sometimes fail to finance these operations. Our great objective today is to ensure that in addition to developing tools for official home improvement programs, this technology can be used by for example, the same picture that, that I showed before, Jorge Prada, on his house and each house he will intervene in the future. We want to disconnect technical assistance from the physical presence of personal because this makes the knowledge transfer process very expensive. Um, before closing, I, I, I couldn't finish without explaining that we have developed the, these six steps of a value chain that can be applied to a home improvement process. This is the most innovative thing that we are working now. This is, um, and, and technical assistance is one part of this process. This vision allows us to work holistically, uh, identifying the complete steps and those that must be developed to achieve a balance and a complete project in a, a housing intervention work. And finally, um, uh, like uh, Jorge Prada was the first homeowner in our experience in Colombia. And like him, we have been working with hundreds more. All homeowners deserve to get out of the poverty circle and have access to technology to provide them technical assistance. That requires everyone's effort to make cities safer. So that housing, in addition to being the most precious asset for the family, complies with the precept of safeguarding their lives and belongings. In the face of a pandemic, as we are now, in the face of a natural disaster, and in conditions that, as we have seen now, the new normality forces us to change our perspective in a minute. Thank you so much. Thank you, Diana. Very nice presentation. We got tons of questions. <laughs> we will unfortunately not be able to answer all of them today, but uh, we will forward the questions to our speakers, those who have not been answered today. So we selected some questions for, for now for the discussion and yeah, we will start now with the discussion. Maybe uh, Stefana can turn on the, the last slide for the Q&A. So the first question maybe uh, for, for both speakers, you can choose, maybe Lucia starts to answer the question. Um, how are policies and government uh, approaches integrates with the kind of work you're doing? Could you elaborate this a bit? Maybe Lucia, mm -hmm. you want to start? Uh, right, so assisted self-help is recognized in, in Mexico since 2008, I believe. Uh, and we have, we have worked with the government. Uh, the thing is that the government right now has two programs or, or two main programs directed to self-help, in which one is reconstruction, in which we had a really important earthquake in 2017, and, and that program is targeted to uh, address to the most vulnerable, 
and to reconstruct their homes. And then we have the cofinance, that it has been like a much more long-standing program that the government has addressed. In this program, uh, the beneficiary or the family has to give savings either in kind or in money, has to get a credit and receives a subsidy. This is subjected to uh, a partnership with a cooperative. In Mexico, the cooperatives are really strong. So then in my case, I work with cooperatives that they give the credit and that can target the, can get the subsidy. The subsidy is down to, to the people and it's given by installments. So then if a family is applying for a housing subsidy, they need to say, okay, uh, you are you're applying for a housing subsidy. I need to see that what you're doing is technically correct. So then we have to upload it to a platform in which the government checks it. And it, if it's okay, then they, they agree upon the subsidy. And then this, the, the money is given by installments in which once they started, they get certain amount of money. Once they have this 30%, they get another installment, but it's subjected to the technical assistance revision. So then a technical assistant, in, in my case, uh, uh, an architect firm Mejoremos goes and sees the construction. If the construction complies with security, with security soundness, with structural soundness, then they upload it to the platform and it is accepted for the family to get the other installment. And that is subsequent in three stages until the family finishes the, the project. Now, it is important to address that this project is only for one phase, no? in which it has to be determined based in the budget, like, okay, it's going to be only enlargement, it's going to be an improvement, or is it going to be a complete uh, new house? Based on that, the amount and the credit are, are calculated, the amount of the subsidy. And then it's, it's checked that the money was used for the construction. If not, there are consequences in which the people have to give back the subsidy. So okay. this has helped us a lot. Okay, nice. Thank you, Lucia. Jana, you also want to comment on this question? Yeah, I, I want to comment because um, as, as Lucia mentioned it, I think we have uh, a different um, approach to the public policy, to the housing public policy in Colombia. Um, since before 1990 in Colombia, uh, we have housing programs led by social institutions, but that is in the past. Now, our public policy, uh, our housing public policy is just based on subsidies. So this is a huge difference between the, the way that, that Lucia mentioned it and, and the way to, to produce uh, improvement in, in informal houses in Mexico and in Colombia. So here we, we are just, or people are just waiting, or homeowners are just waiting to uh, apply to a subsidy. Probably, yeah, they, they can apply if they belong to a fund, um, a worker fund or something like that. They, they can have access to another subsidy uh, or loans or microfinance institutions. But, but, it's, but it's not something that, that begins from the, from the base uh, of the society. And, and I think it's, it's, it, yeah, it's, it's the other uh, side of, of this um, housing public policy in Colombia. Okay, thank you, Diana. Okay. Uh, another question from uh, Bulenza Tiretti would be for both of you as well. Um, how can social accountability be attained when the beneficiaries are not willing to engage in the housing transformation within an informal community that is going to be affected by a big infrastructure project? Do you have experience uh, with that in, in your uh, work? Uh, yes, well, the social accountability is something that in, in, in our methodology we need to, to ensure because it's going to be the project of the people and we take an assisted self-help approach in which we give the technical advice but the family needs to to be responsible of the of the improvement or, or or the construction. However, before engaging in any kind of, of project, we have to do a risk assessment to see if they they have uh, secure land, to see if they are not going to be 
any problems with the environment or if the house is not going to fall because it's in a mountain. All of those kind of things we take into consideration and we also have to, to have some consideration on land tenure, in mm -hmm. which although it doesn't have to be uh, like as a uh, as, uh, escritura, uh, I don't know how to say in English, um, it does have to demonstrate that he has, has consistent possession of, of the dwelling and that he has safety it's safety for us to intervene. Now that's one part of the of the land, but also if the family doesn't want to engage in the improvement, we cannot commit to that because we cannot commit the security of the family in structure, uh, soundness, or inhabitability for them to construct as as they want. It is it is it is discussed, and and the diagnosis of the housing is is made by both of us. You know, the professional architect gives the input, but it's the end of the family who decides. And if the architect does its work correctly, the family is going to accept the project because it's going to be reflected in it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Diana, do you also want yeah. to comment on this question? Uh, or? Yeah, I think it, in, in, in this case, it's, it's almost the same process. There's uh, uh, someone uh, who works for the contractor, who is the, the, the final um, worker and, and, and the final application of the subsidy. And he decides a social worker to, to go to, to the house, to, to the selected house for the subsidy, and then apply this uh, diagnosis of the assessment of the house. And also the homeowner has to sign uh, uh, out the a format just to uh, um, say that it's agree with the, with the design of, or the changes that, that the house will have. And um, related with social accountability, we have been working with several uh, private institutions also, involved them in, 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 in this part of their companies uh, to, to work outside with the homeowners, with the worker construction people, and, and with a lot of them. I think we have um, a huge um, amount of, of private institutions that they can apply also this, this um, social accountability processes in, in, in our projects. Yeah. Okay, thank you uh, very much, Lucia and Diana. Uh, that was actually a very interesting question because what uh, you, you have answered uh, part of it, but, but the person wants uh, uh, to know is uh, in the context of Islam upgrading improvements. Yeah. For mm -hmm. example, if if the house is probably that's that's what I interpret from the question. If there is big infrastructure projects, which the houses might be in, in, in danger of being demolished or whatever, how you handle a, a situation like this? If these people are going through this uh, housing transformation process or this, yeah. Did, uh, did you see the yeah. the point? Yeah, uh, probably, let's say that, for example, in Colombia, that is very extreme. You, you, it's allowed to you to be there in that place or not? If you are not, not allowed to be there because it's a risk area or is, yeah, it's a, a flood uh, close by the river or something like that, it's not allowed to be there and, and you, you cannot uh, invest the money in that house. So, most of the families or houses that are located in risk areas should move to another place. And, and the government knows, and probably they don't have the, the money to do it uh, as far as we want it. But, but those are houses in, in which we cannot work. We, we cannot improve that houses. Probably the homeowners uh, will, will work on, on, on their own house, but we cannot do it. Yeah, I, I, and I saw another question related with that, like uh, you are trying to formalize the informality mm -hmm. uh, or legalize the informality. And, and let's say that, no, this is not our process. The, our process is related with the intervention of the houses directly. Uh, and the government will, um, will address this, these activities related with legalization, with land title, with, with a lot of other uh, kind of uh, things that they have to do uh, to recognize that, that that informal houses. But yeah, we have a, a, a established procedure here in Colombia. Uh, the name of that procedure is Acts of Recognition uh, in order to, 
yeah, to say that instead of you used to be um, illegal, now we recognize that you did it and, and you can go in and improve your house and everything. Okay. Um, yeah. In your case, Lucia, in Mexico? In my case, it, one important thing is that we work with, with subsidies. So, so there are a lot of conditions for subsidy allocation. Uh, so the first thing is that we, we address family by family. So then in the slum upgrading process, I think it's, it's seen from another perspective. We, we look more into the housing uh, situation and to the people that we can, we can help with it. Not right now, uh, before, before this year, there were a lot of conditions to access subsidy and there, and there were a lot of depressed areas in which we couldn't access because they, the families didn't meet the conditions in order for us to help them. But right now the conditions are changing to cater for the most vulnerable population. So that has allowed us to, to, to open the field to work with those families. But it is also dependent on, on political will you know, and with whom they want to, to, which areas they want to intervene. And it's also part of public policy. Uh, as for what Diana was saying about the the question that was made in the chat, it's not that we're we're trying to do informal and informal. I think I think formal and informal is is a really dichotomic uh, mm -hmm. definition. I think we're trying to operate precarious housing, you no, know? and and it's it's nothing to do. I think informal formal is giving a level of vulnerability that we are trying to address. You no, know? so maybe informal is is in the case of loss. But it's still families living there that need to be upgraded. Okay, so that that brings uh, us to I think the last question that maybe encompasses uh, many of the questions that people have asked, because uh, you know we have uh, uh, like a lot and we have to make uh, choices. And I think that question lies in the in the house value chain. If you look at the house value chain from acquiring land or assembling mm -hmm. land for housing until you provide uh, community organizations and, 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 and community in infrastructure, there are a lot of steps in between in which the incremental housing process might encounter several bottlenecks. So many questions somehow relate to that. Like, for example, when you talk about the construction sector or the building material uh, sector, how does that uh, work or, or becomes an, an, an impediment to the incremental uh, process? Because there's always a question of not only availability of local material, but also the affordability of it. So just to give you an example, you could think of, 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 of the land issue, which have, you, you've mentioned all, already but also the accessibility of people to, to social and economic uh, infrastructure. Uh, right, uh, if, if I, uh, I can start with this question, is yes, that yes. often we have separated incremental housing with city, no? and how incremental housing is related to city. And the truth is that in Latin America and in many other places, Incremental housing has been the way by which families have developed their house. So it's it's embedded in the in the value chain. It, it's something that it's it's there, and it's how how can we support it better? Uh, for example, in in incremental housing, it's going to be a lot of of local purchases, and we have to understand how those purchases are. They're going to do incrementally based on the economic capacity of the family. So maybe you are not gonna see a construction from one day to another, but they're gonna be saving little by little. No, it's also the land issue. What, what I was saying in the presentation is that in cities that are so densely populated as Mexico City, it's really important to to take into account the structure because families are going to go up. There's a scarcity on land, so then if the son or the daughter gets married or they have their own family, they're gonna go up. So it's understanding the dynamics in incremental housing and as a part of the city, more than trying to fix incremental housing to have a like, fixed model in the housing value chain. Because incremental housing is 60% is of how Mexicans have built their houses, so. Yes. Okay. Yeah, um, I, um, I, I 
Yeah, I, I think I, I don't have more comments than, than Lucia did, but I just want to mention that uh, we have also this value chain uh, that, that involves the private sector uh, because we need to define the finance part of, for example, uh, an, an intervention in home improvement. Um, we need to generate reports uh, about the, the program and we need to build the house, we need to design it and we need to collect uh, data and information from the house and, and from the homeowner. So we, we have tons of, of um, parts or, or steps that, that we need to, to address in order to, to fulfill um, a home improvement. And yeah, I think uh, the, the the last probably, and, and the most important thing is to say that uh, cities going up really, really fast, and there's any city in the world that probably thinks that they will demolish everything and build new houses. So for that reason, uh, entities like uh, Lucia's entity and, and my organization works on this because it's a problem, it's there, we have to do something, we need to find a solution. And the things that we presented today here are, are, are in order to, to solve this, this kind of issues. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Lucia and Diana. We are actually uh, on, on time for the for the closure of this uh, uh, webinar there there were very interesting questions yeah. and but the, the offer that we have as, 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 as the housing group and, and and the IHS is that we will collect all these questions we will share it with you Lucia mm -hmm. and Diana and and try to answer them to the best of our abilities and then we will try to publish this or we will publish this at least that's what we agreed with the marketing and communication uh, department of, of IHS. We will publish this in, in, in the blog of IHS just to wrap up this, this, this webinar and, 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 and give it a, you know, to be seen uh, by others to, that could not join. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody out there. This is a bit strange because we yeah. cannot see yeah. any of you. We can only uh, read your 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 greetings and your and your and your questions, but we're very happy with the number of people that that join us and and we keep uh, the promise that we will continue doing this in 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 the future. So pay attention to our our social media means and 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 see you no know, when 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 are we up again for another uh, of these uh, webinars. Again, thanks a lot in Colombia and Mexico, Lucia and, 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 and Diana. Take yeah. good care of yourself. Yeah. Please, Thank in you. These, in these very difficult uh, times. And we hope to see each other again uh, very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. On behalf of David as well. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you. <laughs> bye. Bye, David. Thank you so much. So now we go and... Uh,